Secret Doctrine, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky spoke of a basic item of cosmogony, reflected in the well-known ancient saying, as above, so below. The microcosm is the miniature copy of the macrocosm, and therefore what is found below can be found often through analogy above. The lifespan of a human being can be seen to follow by analogy, the same path as the seasons of the earth. And in theosophy, it is postulated that the same general process is equally applied to the lifespan of a planet, a solar system, a galaxy, and to the universe itself." End quote. From the key to theosophy, that which is true on the metaphysical plane must also be true on the physical. Macrocosm and microcosm are Greek compound words of macro-large and micro-small. Macrocosm and microcosm refers to a vision of cosmos where the part, microcosm, reflects the whole, macrocosm, and vice versa. It is a feature present in many esoteric models of philosophy, both ancient and modern, closely associated with Hermeticism, Gototh, and underlies practices such as astrology, alchemy, and sacred geometry, with its premise of, as above, so below. HPB also said that in theosophical literature, the macrocosm generally represents the great universe, or cosmos, frequently spelled with a capital K, while the microcosm refers to the human being. Humanity, quote, is the microcosm of the macrocosm. The God on earth is built on the pattern of the God in nature. The philosophy was also conceptualized by Pythagoras, who saw the cosmos and the human body as a harmonious unity. The idea was re-articulated about a century later by Plato, and again during the Renaissance by Leonardo da Vinci, who noted common features between the natural world and the human body, such as the circulation of fluids and basic branching mechanisms. There are many comparisons, from the detail of a leaf to our body, to a land water tract, lightning, and the patterns which flow from particular formations, like concentric circles, spirals, branching. I came across a really cool example of patterns shown in nature by Nor Norwegian nature photographer Kjell Loch Sandvid. My apologies to that person if I have mispronounced their name, who devoted his photographic career to capturing the beauty of the world we live in, and along the way amassed a collection of butterfly and moth images with interesting patterns on their wings. He took notice of the spectacular shapes the natural designs came in recognising their resemblance to letters and collating an alphabet. There is even numeric representation. We can probably apply Einstein's spooky action at a distance comment. By the way, another pattern is letting things develop for themselves to their own needs. Okay, so we have an idea of the denser physical aspects of patterns evident in flora, fauna, humans, nature and the cosmos. Let's touch on fractal patterns. A fractal is a never-ending pattern, infinitely complex, but are self-similar across different scales. They are created by repeating a simple process over and over again in an ongoing feedback loop. Fractals are geometric objects, unlike the Fibonacci sequence, which however does have a natural recursive definition, a common tray of many fractals. And this definition leads to visualizations of the Fibonacci sequence that do exhibit self-similarity. Fractals are not limited to geometric patterns, but can also describe processes in time. Fractal patterns with various degrees of self-similarity have been rendered or studied in images, structures and sounds, and found in nature, technology, art, architecture, Fractals are of particular relevance in the field of chaos theory, since the graphs of most chaotic processes are fractals. Chaos theory is an interdisciplinary theory stating that 
Within the apparent randomness of chaotic complex systems, there are underlying patterns, constant feedback loops, repetition, self-similarity, fractals and self-organisation. A very small change may make the system behave completely differently. Most of us will have heard of the butterfly effect. In general, chaos theory deals with things that are impossible or very difficult to control and predict. Weather is an example of something that is non-linear and difficult to predict accurately. And of course, these fractal patterns are throughout the universe. So there's a cosmos, a weather pattern and a shell. The application of fractals can be found at all levels, including nature, the connection between fractals and leaves, for instance, is currently being used to determine how much carbon is contained in trees. <coughs> Modern medicine often involves examining systems in the body to determine if something is malfunctioning. Since the body is full of fractals, we can use fractal math to quantify, describe, diagnose and perhaps help cure diseases. Fractal applications are in structure, design, that's a DNA on your right. Art, we've all seen beautiful mosaics and mandalas. Now, what do you think this is? In 2018, NASA released this image of actual swirls and vortices of Jupiter's clouds, captured by the Juno spacecraft from 13,345 kilometers above the cloud tops. Even though this is a real image, processed in normal ways and with limited natural colour enhancement is at the same time obviously quite surrealistic and impressionistic and a great example of how nature can be comparable to or surpass even the most fantastic art. Phenomena known to have fractal features include you can all read that, I'm not going to read the whole list and I just want to draw your attention to the fact that fractals are everywhere. So there are a whole lot of things that use this fractal tool. What do you think this is? Skull, light bulb, thank you for saying that. I'm going to show you what it is. The structure inside an apple reveals the flower it unfolded from. This one is apparently not from the Garden of Eden. Uh, this is from Buckminster Fuller. The vector equilibrium is the zero point for happenings or non-happenings. It is the empty theatre and empty circus and empty universe ready to accommodate and act and any audience. Richard Buckminster Fuller was a renowned 20th century American inventor and visionary. Dedicating his life to making the world work for all of humanity, Fuller operated as a practical philosopher and developed numerous inventions mainly architectural designs, and popularised the widely known geodesic dome, which has been called the strongest, lightest and most efficient means of enclosing space known to man. A geodesic dome is a spherical or sphere-like three-dimensional polyhedron made of out of one type of platonic solid. The recognised five platonic solids have been known to us for thousands of years, they're named for the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, influenced by Pythagoras, who hypothesised that the classical elements were made of these regular solids. Buckminster Fuller also said, I'm not trying to counsel any of you to do anything really special except dare to think, and to dare to go with the truth, and to dare to really love completely. Platonic solids govern atomic structures and planetary orbit. We can decode the mysteries of the observable universe through sacred geometry. Speaking of atoms, HPB, um, who I'll now refer to, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, described atoms as the ever eternal existing undifferentiated matter, which is not strictly matter as we ordinarily use the term, but which, as we say, is the atoms. The atoms are indestructible, and matter is destructible in form, but the atoms are absolutely indestructible. I do not speak about chemical atoms, I speak about the atoms of occultism, which certainly no chemist has ever seen. They are mathematical points." 
Regarding transmigrations of the life atoms, HPB explains that the atoms are transferred from one being or object to other, and that this fact is the cause for the teaching about reincarnation. The life atoms can serve a memory of their own. She said, the occultists who trace every atom in the universe, whether in aggregate or single, to one unity or universal life, who do not recognise that anything in nature can be inorganic, who know of no such thing as dead matter. The occultists are consistent with their doctrine of spirit and soul when speaking of memory in every atom, of will and sensation. The atom has three movements of its own, rotation on its axis, orbital motion, for it is continually running around in a small circle, we might feel like that sometimes, um, a pulsation like a heart, a constant expansion and contraction. These three movements are always going on and are unaffected by any force from outside." End quote. Basant and Leadbeater uh, were instructed by adepts in a technique mentioned in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras for psychically envisioning incredibly small objects. They accurately described aspects of atomic structure in 92 natural elements, from hydrogen to uranium. Anu, that you can see on your screen, is a Sanskrit term that means fine, minute, atomic, and is commonly used to refer to an atom of matter, although it can also refer to an atom of time. As HB already noted that movements are always going on, Nikola Tesla, who is my hero, by the way, restates that all things have a frequency and a vibration. This slide shows the patterns created from cymatics, and we can refer to the now well-known Dr. Masaru Emoto's examples of energy vibration impacting water through thought and tension and creating distinct molecular patterns similar to snowflakes. Somatics, predominantly from sound vibration, in case anyone hasn't encountered that. We have many findings in the quantum field, go quantum, to show that information, intentional effects and patterns are connected beyond the limitations of physical location or dimension. Let's look a little more at the micro-macro aspect of our beings. From an article by HPB titled Kabbalist Views on Spirits, no comprehensive idea of nature can be obtained except by applying the law of harmony and analogy in the spiritual as well as in the physical world. As above, so below, is the old hermetic axiom. If spiritualists would apply this to the subject of their own researches, they would see the philosophical necessity of their being in the world of spirit as well as in the world of matter a law of the survival of the fittest. So let's look at our makeup, for to understand it is to best develop it and use it. Let's first remind ourselves of the impact we each have as individuals in a societal model. From a societal perspective in modern sociology, the concept of microcosm has been predominantly used to describe a small group of individuals whose behaviour is typical of a larger social body encompassing it. Conversely, a macrocosm is a social body made up of smaller compounds. The rippling interlinks and impact of behaviour continue in this model. From Key to Theosophy, all human beings have spiritually and physically the same origin. As humankind is essentially of one and the same essence, and that essence is one, infinite, uncreate, and eternal. Whether we call it God or nature, nothing can, therefore can affect one nation or one person without affecting all other nations and all other people. This is as certain and as obvious as that a stone thrown into a pond will, <coughs> sooner or later, set in motion every single drop of water therein, we say that unless every human is brought to understand and accept as an axiomatic truth that by wronging one person we wrong not only ourselves but the whole of humanity in the long run. No familial feelings, 
such as preached by all the great reformers, preeminently by Buddha and Jesus, are possible on the earth, end quote. A pattern is evident of when there is um, some significant event that can create an extended upswell of authentic community caring or brother sisterhood. Examples are mass shootings, environmental terrorism like oil pipeline location, overwhelming tsunami and uh, eruption and earthquake devastation. We also have the Lemurian and Atlantean stories. Catastrophes take us out of insular daily self-centred mode and give us the opportunity to extend our consideration and intent more broadly. Many individuals have been prompted to share in groups to serve in thought and or practical assistance to the beings and land affected. Significant events creating the offer for either collaboration or alternatively destruction are throughout the ages. In ancient Greek folklore, a phoenix is a long-lived bird that cyclically regenerates or is otherwise born again. Associated with the sun, a phoenix obtains new life by arising from the ashes symbolically to emerge from a catastrophe stronger, smarter, more powerful. HPB wrote in The Secret Doctrine that the myth of phoenix relates to the law of existence and being. It is the bird of resurrection and eternity. She added, in whom night follows the day and day the night an allusion to the periodic cycles of cosmic resurrection and human reincarnation. The phoenix lives a thousand years, after which, kindling a flame, it is self-consumed, and then, reborn from itself, it lives another thousand years, up to seven times seven. From Isis Unveiled, according to HPB, one of the objects of the study of the esoteric sciences is that of proving mankind to be identical in spiritual and physical essence with both the absolute principle and with God in nature. The idea is that we are a reflection of the universe containing all of the essential elements present in the latter. Madame Blavatsky elaborated on this as follows. Humanity is a little world, a microcosm inside the great universe like a fetus is suspended by all three spirits in the matrix of the macrocosmos. And while the terrestrial body is in constant sympathy with its parent earth, the astral soul lives in unison with the sidereal anima mundi. They are in it as it is in them. For the world pervading element fills all space and is space itself only shoreless and infinite. As to our third spirit, the divine, what is it but an infinitesimal ray, one of the countless radiations proceeding directly from the highest cause, the spiritual light of the world? This is the trinity of organic and inorganic nature, the spiritual and the physical, which are three in one, and of which Proclus says that the first monad is the eternal God, the second eternity, the third the paradigm or pattern of the universe, the three constituting the intelligible triad. Everything in this visible universe is the outflow of this triad and a microcosmic triad itself." End quote from Isaac. This is like a hologram. Who remembers Star Trek's holodeck? A hologram is a physical structure that diffracts light into an image. As an aside, regarding light, I'm sure we've all heard the references that we are beings of light, which is an energy. HPB says, love is a divine, eternal and infinite power, a light which reflects itself in every object while it seeks not the object, but merely its own reflection therein. The secret doctrine speaks of the paradox that absolute light is darkness. Back to the hologram, which is based on interference patterns within the electromagnetic field. 
Every part of a hologram contains the image of the whole object and contains its particular perspective of the image, but it includes the entire object. What happens if you cut a hologram in half? The concept is that each half contains whole views of the entire holographic image, which is morphic resonance. It describes that if you cut an oak tree into little pieces, each little piece, properly treated, can grow into a new tree. So from a tiny fragment, you can get a whole. Machines don't do that. They do not have this power of remaining whole if you remove parts of them. Chop a computer up into small pieces and all you get is a broken computer. <laughs> it does not regenerate into lots of little computers. If you chop a magnet into small pieces, you do have a whole lot of small magnets, each with a complete magnetic field. This is a holistic property which fields have that mechanical systems do not. Each species has its own fields, and within each organism there are fields within fields. Within each of us is the field of the whole body, fields for arms and legs and fields for kidneys and livers. Within our body are fields for the different tissues inside these organs, and then fields for the cells, and fields for the molecules, and so on. There is a whole series of fields within fields that have a kind of inbuilt memory derived from previous forms of a similar kind. Through the fields, by a process called morphic resonance, the influence of like upon like, there is a connection among similar fields. That means that the field structure has a cumulative memory based on what has happened to the species in the past. This idea applies not only to living organisms, but also to protein molecules, crystals, and even to atoms. The key concept of morphic resonance is that similar things influence similar things across both space and time. The morphic resonance theory of memory suggests that there is a collective memory to which we are all tuned. This concept is very similar to the notion of the collective unconscious. And the topic of epigenetics is also really interesting in, of course, the Akashic Records. From HPB and Problems of Life, as in the microcosm, so in the macrocosm, or the universe, every organ in it is a sentient entity, and every particle of matter or substance, from the physical molecule up to the spiritual atom, is a cell, a nerve center, which communicates with the brain stuff or that substance on the plane of divine thought in which the prime ideation is produced. Therefore, was humankind produced in the image of God or divine nature? Every cell in the human organism mysteriously corresponds with a like cell in the divine organism of the manifested universe. Only the latter cell assumes in the macrocosm the gigantic proportions of an intelligent unity in this or that hierarchy of beings. This, so far as the differentiated divine mind is concerned, on its plane of ideation. This eternal or absolute thought lies beyond and is to us inscrutable." End quote. From the Secret Doctrine, occultism teaches that no form can be given to anything, either by nature or by human, whose ideal type does not already exist on the subjective plane. More than this, that no such form or shape can possibly enter humankind's consciousness or evolve in their imagination, which does not exist in prototype, at least as an approximation." End quote. From the key to theosophy, believing in seven planes of cosmic being and states of consciousness, with regard to the universe or the macrocosm, we stop at the fourth plane, finding it impossible to go with any degree of certainty beyond. But with respect to the microcosm, or human, we speculate freely on the seven states and principles. Theosophy holds that the manifested universe is ordered by the number seven, 
a common claim among esoteric and mystical doctrines and religions. Thus, the evolutionary pilgrimage proceeds cyclically through seven stages, with the first three steps involving an apparent involution, the fourth one being one of equilibrium, and the last three involving a progressive development. In the theosophical view, all major facets of existence manifest following a sevenfold model. Quote, our philosophy teaches us that as there are seven fundamental forces in nature and seven planes of being, so there are seven states of consciousness in which man can live, think, remember and have his being. From the Mahatma letters, number 67, if anyone needs that reference. As man is a sevenfold being, so is the universe. The septenary microcosm being to the septenary macrocosm. But as the drop of rainwater is to the cloud from whence it dropped, and whether in the course of time it will return. The septenary principle, the seven principles of man, which are from the lowest or densest plane until the highest or more spiritual, divide him into two distinct natures. The upper or the spiritual being, composed of three principles or aspects, and the lower or the physical quaternary, composed of four, in all, seven. Our first three come up, if you can imagine like an X, up into our equilibrium, and then we're going to expand out as we grow, and then that just continues with the pattern. And I don't know if you can visualise, but this coming in and expanding and then doing it all over again is a bit like a torus. And you can imagine that through the chakras. Again, from the key to theosophy, it has often been explained that neither the cosmic planes of substance nor even the human principles can be located or thought of as being in space and time, with the exception of the lowest material plane or world and the physical body. As the former are seven and one, so are we seven and one. That same absolute soul of the world, which is both matter and non-matter, spirit and non-spirit, being and non-being. The microcosmic septenary states of consciousness are also described. Waking, waking dreaming, natural sleeping, induced or trance sleep, psychic, super psychic and purely spiritual. The sound of Om is composed of three syllables. In Sanskrit, O is a diphthong sound. It means that it is formed by combining the two sounds, A and U. The difference between the two variations, Aum and Om, developed only due to transliteration. There is vibrational relevance in the three distinct intonations, acknowledging different interpretations. A symbolizes speech, Vak, the waking state, bottom curve. U um, symbolizes the mind, manas, dreaming state, the middle curve, the one over to your right. N mm, symbolizes the breath of life, prana, deep state, sleep state of consciousness, which is the upper curve. There are many other ways that Aum is referenced, such as the levels of conscious, unconscious, and subconscious mind. Then there is the other element of Aum, which is silence, connection to truth, witness of consciousness that is observer of the other three states of consciousness, and that is the dot on the top. Apparently we have an auric egg layer. Described by HPB, having chosen its vehicle, each Kumara egos expands surrounding the human animal with an Akashic aura, while the Manasic principle settles within the human form. During life, that aura is a perpetual motion machine. The auric egg is also called the Atmic aura, but it is not the same as the human aura, as the term is usually used, though the latter is part of the auric egg. It endures throughout the cycles of reincarnation of the human being. When referring to auric egg in all its aspects, she wrote, it is also the material from which the adept forms their astral bodies. 
and the septenary model extends beyond individual humanity to planets and races. Root races are stages in human evolution as described in the Secret Doctrine. Past races existed mainly on now lost continents. Unfortunately, we don't have time to consider this in any real detail other than its example of the pattern applying in an extended way. William Meader in 2005 wrote the Antakarana bridge and its relationship to the sacred can be examined in the context of humanity as a whole. From the esoteric perspective, humanity is considered a single living entity. Just like with an individual, humanity has a personality and a soul, and even a budding antakarana. As well as the seven different planes, there is a pattern of cycles. Most of us have heard of the yuga periods. Hinduism teaches the existence of four yugas, or ages, which together comprise the Mahayuga, or Great Age, which is but itself an extremely minuscule and fleeting part of the entire Mahamanvatara, the life cycle of the manifested universe. We have cycles at every level. If we breathe in and out, so is the cosmos, just more and bigger, way bigger, beyond comprehension bigger. Maybe that rabbit hole they talk about going down is a black hole, and a wormhole, and the hole. You are also in a cycle of life and death, light and dark in yourself, and unfolding with expansion. Nature has its cycles with night, day, seasons, magnetic and thermodynamic flows, waves. The planet has its cycle of revolutions, as do stars and galaxies. Theosophy shares information much more than in this presentation to explain the sevenfold constitution of human beings and the universe, souls after death adventure, and the evolutionary process of planetary life through sevenfold gyrations, called rounds and chains, which are the evolutionary cycles in which the monads of the different kingdoms of nature, from elementals to human beings, engage. The concept of the universe evolving for purposes of self-discovery and creative expression is found not only in modern European philosophy, but also in ancient myths all over the world. The Hindu Puranas speak of our universe as Brahma, and of alternating periods of cosmic activity and rest <laughs> as the days and nights of Brahma, each of which spans over four billion years, an oscillating universe reminiscent of modern cosmological theory. In each creation, Brahma attempts to fashion an ever more perfected humankind, in the process of which he serially evolves from his own consciousness and root substance, all of nature's kingdoms, atoms, minerals, plants, animals, and so forth. Conversely, Stories allude also to the striving of mankind, and for that matter, of all sentient beings, to become Brahma-like in quality, to express more and more of the hidden mind pattern of the cosmos. From the Secret Doctrine. The act of power, the perpetual motion of the great breath, only awakens cosmos at the dawn of every new period, setting it into motion by means of the two contrary forces, the centripetal and centrifugal force, both male and female, positive and negative, physical and spiritual, where both compose the one primary force, and thus causing it to become objective on the plane of illusion. In one of his letters, Master K.H. wrote to Mr. Sinnott, the world moves in cycles, which proceed under the impetus of two mutually antagonistic and destroying forces, the one striving to move humanity onward towards spirit, the other forcing mankind to gravitate downward into the very abysses of matter. It remains with humankind to help either the one or the other. Thus also it is our present task as theosophists to help in one or the other direction 
It's really on each of us to determine our action and impact. The choice and responsibility are ours. To consider our preferred option and apply it, we would need to know thyself as authentically as possible to recognise where we are and why in influencing further decisions. We also need to follow the pattern of nature and the essential element of biodiversity. Likewise, we need to value and support the working out of personality diversity, but this is our purpose and opportunity to expand beyond them rather than remain limited in self-created emotional boundaries. William Meader said, humanity too has its antakarana under construction, though it is only in its infant stage. Even so, when an individual further develops his or her inner bridge, humanity's antakarana is likewise enhanced. The part contributes to the evolution of the whole such as the law of existence. Even our own body shows us the necessity of different roles and functions working together for the best expression of the whole. Each cell, organ and atom community does its own thing and links into main areas with the arterial network to contribute their part for the functioning whole. We actually inhabit a living universe reflected by the most fundamental characteristics of our body's biology. As is the smallest, so is the greatest. Scientists have confirmed that a single cell is a complete system, as is the brain and the entire body. Every single system is driven by feedback loops and equilibrium, even bacteria. Cells communicate, work together, fight off enemies, sometimes each other, and also, just by the way, trees communicate. They have full relationships and communication using their extended root systems. So we've come full circle, or maybe spiral. We've started with our body, traveled through the cosmos, and come back into our body. Correspondences, analogies, meaningful connections, and patterned repetitions exist among all things in the universe. By using those correspondences, we can use what we know to discover the unknown self and all. If we're not clear of the information for decision making, we have guidance should we seek it, and a hierarchy for that purpose, ready to share their learning and acquired wisdom. The secret doctrine recognises that no such thing as dead or blind matter, teaching that everything in the universe is alive, endowed with a consciousness of its own kind and on its own plane of perception. The ascending scale of beings in every kingdom from the smallest particle to the largest supergalaxy are so many expressions of the universal oversoul which itself is rooted in the boundless eternal all. No anthropomorphic or human being, this immutable source is the origin of force and of all individual consciousness and supplies the guiding intelligence in the vast scheme of cosmic evolution, spiritual, intellectual and physical." End quote. So how can we summarise this inf information? This is my interpretation for what we are, what are relevant patterns to resonate in and yes there are seven. We'll cover three points, what the pattern is, how it's shown, and its relevance to us. Our experience is a pattern of perpetual energetic vibration and motion, shown in Anu, quantum physics, or sense. We are constantly emanating energy, whether consciously or not. Second, there are cycles within a great plan, shown in breath in out, life death, reincarnation, evolution unfolding, yuga cycles. We are in an eternal, multi-dimensional, ever-expanding, spiral, toroid revolution. Remembering this is just my interpretation. <laughs> Accessing data is easy. Discerning your highest truth takes effort. We choose how we use it, 
act consciously. Sixth point. The whole is in each part, shown in holograms, resonance, cellular epigenetic memory. We are an atom spark of and in the divine. Each part has its place in the whole, shown in biodiversity, biology, society, different experiences shared, roles and hierarchy. We are each a wanted, meaningful contribution, either potential or actual, or we wouldn't be here. All is connected, shown in nature, biology, society, cosmos, quantum physics, that there is no time and space limitation in our effect on others. Everything we think and do directly impacts all. As above, so below. We are the drops of the shoreless ocean. We're going to have a summary of the seven points. And I'm going to read two more quotes from HPB, and then there'll be one last slide. The universe is worked and guided from within outwards. As above, so it is below. As in heaven, so on earth, and humankind. The microcosm and miniature copy of the macrocosm is the living witness to this universal law and to the mode of its action. We see that every external motion, act, gesture, whether voluntary or mechanical, organic or mental, is produced and preceded by internal feeling or emotion, will or volition, and thought or mind. As no outward motion or change, when normal, in our external body, can take place unless provoked by an inward pulse, given through one of the three functions named, so with the external or manifested universe. The whole cosmos is guided, controlled, and animated by almost endless series of hierarchies of sentient beings, each having a mission to perform, and who, whether we give to them one name or another, and call them dying chans or angels, are messengers in the sense only that they are the agents of karmic and cosmic laws. And from key to theosophy, theosophy is the shoreless ocean of universal truth, love and wisdom, reflecting its radiance on the earth, while the theosophical society is only a visible bubble on that reflection. Theosophy is divine nature, visible and invisible, and its society, human nature, trying to ascend to its divine parent. Theosophy, finally, is the eternal fixed sun, and its society, the evanescent comet, trying to settle in an orbit to become a planet, ever revolving within the attraction of the sun of truth. It was formed to assist in showing to humankind that such a thing as theosophy exists, and to help them to ascend towards it by studying and assimilating its eternal verities. I will leave you with Kurt Vonnegut's thought, everything is nothing with a twist. <laughs> Namaste. Uh, would you like to take any questions? Uh, you can ask. Uh, <laughs> you can ask anything. Okay. Just yeah. check, yeah. It also sounds very highfalutin, doesn't it? It's sort of expansive, it's wonderful and everything, but it really comes down to the individual's choice. How do we communicate that everything is nothing to everyone? Thank you for that question. Uh, it shows that you actually listen through to pick up on everything is down to us as individuals. That has also been um, a theme through other talks. How do we show that? That's up to you. How are you being all that you can be and are to reflect that and be an example of all it is. Every interaction you have, the energy you radiate, whether you're doing that um, consciously in a conversation or just being there with energy going out, you're responsible for that. So that would be my answer. It's like you're actually the one driving that, which is the whole point of what I was wanting to say. <laughs>